As I mentioned, we want to take a look at the words which are recorded by the prophet Amos in the eighth chapter of his book, verses four through seven, where we will just read the opening portion uh, of that again, verses four and five. Listen to this, you who trample on the needy to wipe out the oppressed from the land, who say, when will the new moon be over so that we can sell grain? When will the Sabbath end so that we can open the grain bins? Then we will make the bushel smaller and make the shekel weight heavier. We will cheat with dishonest scales. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we give our attention to your word, we thank you for this opportunity. Give us hearts and minds that are focused solely upon the truth of this word. Help us to put out all other things so that by the power of your spirit, we might grow in our faith and in our knowledge to the glory of your name. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. I think most of us here this morning are familiar with that saying, money makes the world go round. What does that actually say? Well, it means, obviously, money is very important. In fact, some might say it is the most important thing in life. It is essential in life. It means that you can't live without it. We have to have it. It suggests that if we have enough money, we can solve all of our problems in life. I thought of that particular scene in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where uh, George Bailey, you know, uh, tried to commit suicide because he thought all was lost. He had lost $5,000. Uh, that was the bank's money. He couldn't find it. And, you know, good old Clarence, the uh, guardian angel, shows up and starts talking about his problem to Clarence. And Clarence says, well, we don't need money where I come from. And George says, comes in awful handy down here. We would all agree that money does come, into ha come in handy. It comes in handy when you want to go to the grocery store and buy food comes in handy when we go to the store and want to buy clothes. comes in handy when we want to make that mortgage payment for that home that we live in, or the car payment, the car that we are driving. Basically, we would say money comes in handy for most of the things that we do in life. And since we depend on it so much in our life, it can very well become the center of our lives, the only thing that we focus on. No matter who we are, no matter what our financial situation is, whether we're rich, we're poor, we're a part of the middle class, whether we are young, whether we are old, it doesn't matter what our situation is. All of us are susceptible to the sin of greed. It's for that reason that the Apostle Paul, in writing to Timothy in his first letter in the sixth chapter, writes this warning for all people. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it but if we have food and clothing we will be content with that people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs you know, it's always good to ask the question when you look at these verses, what is the root of all kinds of evil? And it's inevitable that someone will say money. But that's not what Paul said. It's the love of money. What Paul is doing is echoing what Jesus warned in Luke's gospel in the 12th chapter when he said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. With these warnings in Scripture, it's very obvious that greed is a very dangerous sin that lurks in the hearts of every human being. Greed had certainly become a part of the lives of the children of Israel, particularly those who were wealthy among the Israelites in the northern kingdom in the 700s before the time of Christ. The words of our text before us this morning are, not, are spoken not long before God is going to bring judgment. And you'll rec 
recall that in the last verse of our text for today, God said, I'm not going to forget what you have done. He's brought his judgment for this and many other sins upon them in 722, where the northern kingdom, the ten tribes to the north, fall out, falls out of existence and never comes back again. When we think about the seriousness of God's judgment and what he says to us this morning, we want to take a look at the sins pertaining to wealth here in, in, amongst the Israelites in our text for today and see how our lives compare to that of theirs. As we do that, we do it under the warning, beware the sin of greed. In 2 Kings, we're told this about the life of the man who was currently ruling the northern kingdom. In 2 Kings 14, we're told he, namely Jeroboam II, did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Now, this verse not only summarizes Jeroboam II, it summarizes his reign, it summarizes what was going on amongst the children of Israel in the northern kingdom at this particular time. Now, this is in the 700s. In 930 B.C., Jeroboam I rebelled against Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And the, the consequence of this rebellion was that the kingdom of Israel now became divided. Ten of the tribes followed Jeroboam I and made up what was, would become known as not only the northern kingdom, but what we referred to in the Old Testament scriptures as Israel. Now, Jeroboam I was worried about his people going to Judah, the other two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, known as Judah. He was concerned that they would go there to worship in Jerusalem, and he'd lose these people. So he came up with a bright idea after consulting with people within his court. His bright idea was this. He was going to make two images of a golden calf. And he would set these images up at Gilgal and Beersheba. And what the children of Israel were to do was to worship these golden calves as if they were the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 12, we're told, after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. So he erects these two statues, and they're to be thinking that they're worshiping the true God as they worship them. But you know what they easily slipped into because of their assimilation with the Canaanite gods of Baal and Ashtoreth? The northern kingdom worshipped those two gods. The end result was is that the northern kingdom never did follow the Lord. They were always guilty of idol worship. It was a time when the northern kingdom was also experiencing great expansion and riches. Now, the world power at this time is Assyria. And Assyria had been causing them problems, but at this particular time, their king wasn't very strong. So he left them alone. Well, what did this allow Jeroboam II to do? He could deal with some of his other enemies in the vicinity, particularly enemies who had stolen land from the Israelites. And so he was able to accomplish great military victories. He took that land back. The spiritual corruption of Jeroboam's kingdom was coupled then with military victories, expanded territory, and renewed national pride amongst the Jews. This meant that the northern kingdom experienced a brief period of peace and also great prosperity, because this opened up new opportunities for them to do trade. They prospered. The wealthy merchants inhabited the cities, and in a sense, the wealthy merchants controlled the cities. In the fifth chapter, Amos says that these individuals lived in stone mansions. In the third chapter, he says that the inner walls of these mansions are lined with ivory. Some of the rich families even had so much money that they were able to have winter and summer residencies. From all outward appearances, this, what we might label as the Silver Age of Israel, 
was rivaling the golden age of Israel under the rules of David and Solomon. What we learn from this book of Amos was that these riches had become the gods of these wealthy merchants. And what were they doing with their wealth? They weren't using it in a God-pleasing way. They had come to worship it. They had allowed greed to take over in their lives. And as a result, they were actually taking advantage of the poor and oppressing them. They lived high in the hog at the expense of the lowly class among them. In the second chapter, Amos writes, they trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground, and they deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. The courts had been corrupt. These courts, which should have brought justice to these poor people amongst them, was actually taking advantage of them. In the fifth chapter, we read, For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and take bribes. You deprive the poor of justice in the courts. And what about religion? Well, religion was flourishing at these two shrines. Okay? And the wealthy, they certainly showed up to worship there. But this ceremony and this sacrificing that they did was, was accompanied with nothing but ungodly living. In the fifth chapter, Amos writes, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. In other words, hypocrisy. Oh yeah, you're doing all the right things outwardly, but inside, and I think of something that Jesus said of the Pharisees, you're nothing but rotting corpses. There was nothing about their worship that was pleasing to the Lord. In the words then that are before us in the 8th chapter for this morning, the Lord turns his attention now to the greedy merchant class specifically. Their offenses were not the fact that they had wealth. And this goes back to something that I said in relationship to what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Wealth is not the problem, but it's our relationship with it how we view it. The fact here, as he points out, is they're gaining their wealth at the expense of their needy countrymen. And all of this they're doing under the charade of what? Well, we're believers in the Lord. We're followers of the Lord. In our text, he writes, listen to this, you who trample on the needy to wipe out the oppressed from the land, who say, when will the new moon be over so that we can sell grain? When will the Sabbath end so that we can open the grain bins? Did they observe the times of worship, the Sabbath day weekly, or this new moon festival? At the beginning of every month, they celebrated the beginning of the month, and they had to take time off, shut down their shops, set shut down their buying and selling. Did they do all these things? All religiously, to the letter. But what were they doing while they were observing these special days? The whole time, where are their minds? Was it on worshiping the Lord? Was it on what the Lord was saying to them through the prophets? Absolutely not. They didn't have watches, but if they did, they would have been going like this thinking, how many more minutes until the Sabbath day is over? How many more minutes till this new moon festival is over? And as soon as it's over, I'm going to be out there opening up those grain bins again, selling my wares so that I can make money. I don't want to lose one minute. All they could think about was their business and how they could generate more wealth. That's easy for us to sit here and point the finger at these men and the things that they were doing in respect to making wealth, but... Let's think about ourselves for a moment. Do we sometimes neglect the opportunities for worship in order for us to make a little extra cash on the side, make a little overtime pay so that we can go out and spend it on things that we don't necessarily need but luxuries that we would like to have? Or are we in God's house and do we let the thoughts of profit and gain of our business occupy our minds and our hearts while our mouths are 
singing hymns or praying prayers? Do we go to church reluctantly or participate in public worship half-heartedly because what is time? Time is money, right? And do we fail to use that time in feeding our souls so that we might grow spiritually? Do we couple such disrespect for the Lord with a lack of concern for our fellow man? All of us have to admit that we are guilty of these sins. We are no better than these wealthy merchants that Amos is taking to task. And if this was not bad enough, that they were half-heartedly worshiping the Lord, that their minds were on other things, that all they could focus on is how much money they could make, when they did it, they weren't honest. He says, then we will make the bushel smaller and make the shekel weight heavier. We will cheat with dishonest scales. We will buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. We will sell the chaff with the grain. Now, I'm going to spare you all the details here as to exactly what they were doing. I think you get the picture. They weren't honest. They were cheating the poor. And in the process of it all, do you see how bad it was? The reality was is that some of the poor at this particular time actually had to sell themselves and their families into slavery in order to be able to afford to feed their families and avoid starvation. They were at the mercy of this wealthy ruling class, people who masqueraded as God's people. You know, James has something to say about this in the fifth chapter of his epistle in the New Testament. He said, now listen, you rich, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look. The wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. It's all kinds of forms of government, isn't there? We might all have our opinion upon which one is the best. But it doesn't matter what form you talk about. You do realize that all of it can be corrupted through greed. There is no excuse for using what we have as power over those who do not. Honesty is something that is going to mark the lives of people who are Christians. A Christian is going, going to want to give a good measure. A Christian is going to want to give a quality product for a fair price. A Christian is not going to take what he or she has and package it together and advertise it deceptively and excuse their behavior by saying, let the buyer beware. You see, Paul wrote this in his letter to the Philippians. Each of you should look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Whether we're in business officially or just in our day-to-day -day lives, we all do business, right? Have we ever done business in such a way that it's a little on the shady side? Maybe we've hidden something in the deal. So as to take advantage of someone else so that we didn't have to pay the price, so to speak? Do we always have to get what the world says something is worth? When we look particularly at the individual who is on the other end of this business deal and we see their particular needs? Do you know what else marks those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Love for others. John in his first epistle said, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions 
and in truth. Now, in case you and I don't understand exactly what John is getting at when he says we are to love our brothers, he starts out with the supreme example, doesn't he? He talks about Jesus. Jesus loved us, and he made that supreme sacrifice. It didn't involve gold or silver, because you recall what Peter said, it's not with gold or silver that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with what? The precious blood of Christ. Now, why does he call it precious? It's precious because you can search the world over for all generations, and you're not going to find any of that quality. And what do I mean by that? It's holy. It's perfect. Jesus did no wrong. The price to pay for our sins was the shedding of that blood. The innocent died for the guilty. He became the guilty so that you and I might become innocent. And so it is, he says to you and to me, and, and you know what? The, don't any of us sit here this morning and say, oh, I'm not rich. We are very rich. We are very rich. We are living in a time when we have a standard of living that really, if you look throughout the history of the world, you can't find this standard of living. All of us know of opportunities for us to help others who are in need. So think about this, for instance. Let's say you have a washing machine that's getting old, it's still working okay, but you decide that you're going to replace it. So you replace it. Now you get this washing machine. Your first thought is to sell it. Maybe you can get 50, 75 bucks for it. But now you know this family who is struggling. By no fault of their own, they're struggling. So what are you gonna do? Contact them and say, hey, I got a deal for you. I'll sell you this washing machine for 50 bucks. Why don't you just give it to them? Well, wait a minute. You start practicing business that way, the next thing you know, you're not going to have anything. Says who? Where does what we have come from? It doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from me. The Lord said to the children of Israel, when you get into this land that is so rich, don't say, look at what my hands have done. Remember where it's come from. It's come from me. Everything you and I have comes from the Lord. Sat down with my grandson a few weeks ago as I had an opportunity in the garage to discuss this with him at the age of five. The things we have come from Jesus, not from us. And they're put into our hands not to be used selfishly, but to be used in ways that advance God's love into the lives of other people. Let's be careful that we don't, quote, practice religion, but follow the ways of the world. Let's see these as opportunities to sh let the love of Christ flow into the lives of others and help others. And always know this. Go read first, 2 Corinthians excuse me, 8 and 9. The Lord promises us that as we live our lives in such a way, looking at our possessions in this way, he takes care of us. Don't ever worry about whether or not you're going to have enough until the day the Lord calls you out of this life. You will as God's people. Beware of greed. It lurks behind every corner, looking for, an, looking for an opportunity to take control of our lives and our hearts and to take away from us what is truly priceless, namely the forgiveness of sins that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, which guarantees us what? Riches beyond our wildest imagination in God's eternal kingdom, which never, ever, Go out of existence. May we repent of our selfishness and greed that has taken control in our, all of our lives at some time or another and take serious our time in, the, in God's grace and his word so that by the power of that word, by the power of his spirit working in our hearts, we might become generous tools of the almighty God in the lives of other people. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our worship today continues with the gathering of our thank offering.